Political Prude, episode 4. It's gonna be an exciting one. Back in July 2020, like an NUS dentistry student was convicted of like an offense of causing hurt to his ex-girlfriend uh, by strangling her and pressing her eye after she declined to revive their relationship. So the district judge uh, found that his relative youth, his rehabilitative prospects, and also the lack of a previous conviction made, you know, a CBS, a community-based sentence, um, a viable option. The sentence that was given, uh, that was imposed, was a 12-day detention order, um, 80 hours of community service, and then a five-month day reporting order. So obviously, like, when we all read this news, like, there was this massive backlash on social media. And a lot of us like express our unhappiness on, with the sentence and we questioned whether or not, you know, um, lighter sentences were imposed on those with like privileged backgrounds or those who, you know, were excelling academically, you know, because there was so much focus on how he was like an NUS student, right? So uh, who was in like a, like, you know, prestigious course, right? Dentistry. Today's episode is really for us to like learn more about the um, criminal justice system and really wanting to zoom in on specifically like sentencing. So joining me today is uh, Parliamentary Secretary Rahayu. She'll, she'll be joining this episode to help answer um, and clarify some of these questions. Ms. Rahayu Maz for the Ministry of Health, and prior to her political appointment, she was a lawyer specializing in civil litigation and family law, and was also a former deputy registrar of the Sharia Court. Hello. Hi. Where are you? Thanks Hi, for coming. Nice, how are you? Thank you for perfect, having me. Perfect timing. <laughs> All right. So, you know, obviously this chat is going to be uh, like a, a, a tough one, right? Because, I mean, it is a very sensitive topic and I, I didn't know whether or not, you know, this, this, this uh, live stream will even happen. Uh, because of like the sensitive nature of it. So I just want to say, first of all, like, thank you so much for saying yes to this and coming onto the show. Thank you so much for doing this because I think it's a platform like yours that allows us to actually, you know, share information, um, edify the community and, um, you know, we learn uh, um, from each other, you know, through this process. So thank you for the opportunity. Yes. All right. So, uh, but I have to be honest with you, okay, because like, obviously when I was talking to all my other, you know, like followers and whatnot, like I think um, a lot of the sentiment was largely negative when it came to this mm. case. So just giving you a heads up that maybe not everything is going to be like PG and fun for this live stream. Um, I will be giving you very, very honest kind of like feedback uh, from, from the youth community. Yeah, so heads up. <laughs> so um, let's like just jump, jump right into it. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the roles of stakeholders as well as like the criminal justice system. So... I think, especially for me as well, like because of the NUS dentistry case, um, I think that there's been this new wave of interest on like the criminal justice system, um, you know, and that like like GE, right? That is a very intimidating thing for like an average person to want to like find out more about. So just like how I asked my other guests, I would like you maybe to maybe give an overview of what the criminal justice system uh, is like. So firstly, um, let's talk about the criminal justice system itself. What's the point of the mm -hmm. criminal justice system? The criminal justice system is in place to actually uphold justice, to um, ensure public safety and um, protect victims as well as to punish and rehabilitate uh, offenders, right? So um, for that system to work, you have to have different stakeholders um, and the um, different stakeholders play different roles. The first stakeholder is the parliament, parliament, because that's where laws come from. Uh, parliament, we debate, um, you know, a bill is proposed, we debate, and things become laws, things become statutes, and the range of sentences for offences for that is put in place. So that's one stakeholder. The second is the uh, police, because you have laws, and when people break the laws, police comes in to um, respond to these incidents and to also investigate the matters. Once the police investigates the matters and there's a crime, there's a charge, it passes it over to the third stakeholder, which is the prosecutors. Okay. It's okay. okay for you so far? So the attorney... So yes, no, yes. The, the <laughs> and what they do is that they are the ones who actually prosecute the case. They assess the case, the information that the police gives them, and then uh, conducts prosecution in court to charge the uh, mm. person, um, uh, you know, um, the... the the offender and then the offender actually has an opportunity to defend 
him or herself. And so you also have then the false okay. stakeholder is the defense lawyers, the defense counsel. So defense counsel represents the accused um, in court um, and actually tell their side of the story to the judge. Understood. So the judge can decide. Um, and then you then have the fifth stakeholder, which is the courts. Because the courts will then, based on the information that the prosecutors have given, and also the information that the defense counsel has given, has to decide whether uh, beyond reasonable doubt there is a, a case made out. So if um, the court feels yes, then um, the court will actually um, uh, make a conviction. And after okay. a conviction, once you decide guilty or not guilty, right? or if the accused actually says, okay, I plead guilty, once okay. that's decided, then you have sentencing. So that's where sentencing right. comes in. The judge will decide what is the okay. sentence. Um, right. So, and finally, once the sentence is given, then um, we also have this other stakeholder, um, prisons. And the um, MSF, um, uh, Probation and Community Rehabilitation Services, which administers the sentence and orders. Um, so these are the stakeholders who are in place. Maybe if you allow okay. me a bit more time, I just elaborate a little bit on how then the system works. Right? So once the, okay. um, I think because the keen interest is really in sentencing. So like I said earlier, the judge decides, right, on the case. So if the person says, um, I'm not guilty, then the case goes through the court process and the court has to make that determination. But if the person pleads guilty, then a judgment is made on that, a conviction is made. After that, you have sentencing. And this is where the court will consider a few sentencing principles. But the treatment um, is also different for youth offenders and adult offenders. So for youth offenders, um, you know, at the forefront, um, dominant consideration is rehabilitation. For adult offenders, rehabilitation is not typically the first thing the court considers, but it is a factor um, in cases where the um, uh, offender shows a very high propensity, you know, of um, um, actually uh, rehabilitating and also the special circumstances. Um, but typically, you have all the different other uh, punishments, you know, fines and... Um, uh, imprisonment and community-based sentencing is one of those um, that is looked at under uh, adult offenders. Lah. So that's just roughly it. And that system okay. is something that continues to evolve and develop as our norms evolve and develop, you know, okay. and we continually try to improve it. Um, so when matters are raised, you know, then issue is put up and the government may decide to put up a bill, then parliament will argue and debate it. And, you know, over time, we continue to build on, on that uh, justice system, criminal justice system. And um, so this platforms like this are useful. So when an issue comes up and, you know, concerns are raised by public, we may need to review certain laws. And so this is why it's useful to continue to have diverse viewpoints. Right. And then we, we hear what are people's concerns and probably address that. So thank you so much for taking the time to explain that. Arising from like, obviously a lot of these recent cases, right? There has been, you know, this increased interest in like the sentencing aspect of the criminal justice system. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost as if like, there's a pattern going on. It's like every time this, uh, a similar case like this happens, then there will be like major outrage online. And, um, you know, one of the things that people want to like usually focus on is whether or not these sentences is fair and just to your to your average person. Specifically for this case, right, the women's wing of like the PAP, which you are a member of, like issued like a statement um on the case, and they said that you know they were dismayed that the sentence appears disproportionate to the offense. So I mean, obviously having you as a guest, um, and also being both a member of the women's wing and also like a, a lawyer, right? So like. I, I'm interested to hear, like, what are your personal views on, you know, this statement that was released? Mm. So, um, you know, as a woman, clearly when I um, hear about another woman being hurt, violated, I get very affected. And I think a lot of things, um, when we hear about um, people being hurt, we uh, react, right? And so um, that's, I think, something that's... Um, that is what we're seeing, you know, people feeling very strongly about the fairness of the matter, especially um, looking at the trauma it is inflicted on the victim. Um, as a lawyer, though, when I, I look at, um, when I hear about judgments um, and things are put up in the media, uh, the instant reflex actually to say, hey, let's take a step back. What are the facts of the case? Uh, so that's actually something that's very important because, um, we actually have to consider uh, firstly fully whether we know what the circumstances are and then 
also try and understand the court's rationale for deciding a certain mm-hmm. way. And then to before we kind of kind of jump to deciding whether um, you know, there is unfairness. Um, but if mm-hmm. there are gaps or where there are things that we can improve on, I think that's something that people should give feedback on. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm the same way in a sense that like, I want to find out all the facts first before I react to something. I think that has been something that I've always been you know, very certain about like before I comment online. Um, but I, I think in specifically for this case, I was like reading all the news and everything. And it's like, you know, there's, I, I, I can't help but feel conflicted, right? Because it's like on one hand, um, a lot of the people from like the, the law side were saying, like, it is fair, it is just. But then like my instinct was like, it's not. So that's why I really wanted to do today's session. I just, just to give you like a, a, a sensing of like why this was such an important stream for me, because one, I wanted to clarify and like, and two, I wanted to also on behalf of everybody who has written, you know, their opinions and whatnot, like also give it um, uh, as an official, like kind of like feedback, as you mentioned, you know, as to um, whether or not we, we think uh, the, the law is like just in that way. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. With that as like a, a, a segue, like, you know, the previous cases of like all these NUS um, students or university students, uh, the, the cases of them, like, you know, they have been perceived uh, to have been like let off easy. I think after having so many of such cases come out, whereby, okay, like time and time again, we feel like the sentences were uh, too, too, too light for, 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 the, for the crime. Um, it has left a lot of us youths like very, very upset because, you know, we tend to see that there is like a correlation between like social status, academic background, um, and then how, and that to like how the court deems like um, the sentence, right? So like for me, that's how I feel. And I think a lot of other people feel that way as well. Um, Like how about you? Like, do you feel that, you know, perhaps there might be a little bit of like an injustice in the way the court does their sentencing? I think um, we've got to really acknowledge that you know that's human nature right and i think it, it's good that people are sensitized and um feel you know when they are concerned about something um to actually address that and put it up and say hey what's 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 up right but i would just say that you know for the cases that you see in the media the thousands of other cases that are also not necessarily um reported um or, or reported in the in the media and not actually um told about so, for example, when you mentioned about how, um, you know, people are seeing a lot more of, like, people who are in universities, um, uh, you know, having um, very good academic um, backgrounds, seemingly um, getting lighter sentences. I think we should um, be conscious that um, the circumstances of cases may, may differ, and we're only seeing these particular cases. So, just because um, a few offenders... Um, happen to be university graduates and they are sentenced a certain way, it, it, it's a little um, dangerous to also jump to the conclusion that they are a certain way because of their academic qualifications, that they were sentenced a certain way because of that. Because there are thousands of other cases that actually the court sees, right? And um, considerations are, are given because of the circumstances. So um, an offender, for example, who is may not have... Um, very good academic performance in school or not may not even be in school, if that person has a good prospect of reform, the court will still take into account that factor in assessing the sentence given to him or her. Um, I'll give you one example. Actually, this, this one case, um, the offender um, was 21 years old when he was okay. sentenced to one charge of um, unlawful assembly. The case went on appeal and the Chief Justice actually um, uh, found in the facts that, um, you know, he was... Um, so this guy was actually um, not um, a graduate or anything, but um, he was um, assessed to be suitable for community-based sentencing. So I told you that's one of the things. Rehabilitation was a consideration in uh, CBS. Uh, because he remained crime-free since his offence, he had okay. kept regular okay. employment. Um, and tried to um, improve his employment status. He, he's married, he's got a young family with four children and his wife was supportive. Um, and that was the main uh, motivation for him to reform himself. He had gotten a rental flat. So this guy is by no means like, you know, high flyer or whatever. He was not really, in, um, you, know, you know, financially he's trying to build himself. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. But he had, um, he showed the, he showed the court that he had a propensity for rehabilitation, was keen to reform, and in that case, the court actually, uh, the chief justice actually overturned the original sentence of imprisonment, and actually um, ordered uh, community-based sentencing instead. So oh, this is a okay. case you may not know of, right? And the others may not know of. I, but, no. <laughs> uh, so so in that sense, um, um, it's not fair to kind of um jump to the conclusion that because, okay, a few undergrads um, um, had been given community-based sentencing or had gotten what deemed, is deemed as lighter sentence, um, it's because of their, um, um, of that. But it is really the uh, point of rehabilitation. And I think that is key. Um, so something that we may want to just think about, because like I said, the cases that we see, the cases that are put in the media, may be a fraction of the many cases um, and in fact, in countless cases, um, there are people who are not undergrads who have been given rehabilitative sentences. Now, now that you, you're, you're talking a little bit more about like the sentencing process, so like I think that's specifically what I think what the bulk of this live stream um, I want to focus on because I have so many questions about like sentencing, right? So um, like maybe you can help demystify what like the sentencing process is like. Um, first, and then I, I'll zoom into like specific questions about that. Yeah. So basically, sentencing is when the judge decides on what the appropriate punishment is for the offender after his conviction. So remember that the guilty, not guilty. So once that's decided, then the court will decide what is the correct sentence. How the court, okay. decide, how the court decides this is within the range set by the law. So there will be a certain... You know, the statutes that the court refers to, the court will then have to look at what is the maximum sentence, minimum sentence, and decide what is the correct sentence to be given in this particular case. Um, so, sentencing is not an exact science, but neither is it um, an arbitrary um, exercise of raw discretion. The court looks at previous cases, you know, benchmark it against certain things, but no two cases are alike. So, the sentence eventually will turn on a myriad of factors like and it depends on the facts of each case. Can okay, okay. Thanks for thanks for explaining that. So you know, let's let's really zoom in onto like the different principles, right? Because what from what I understand, like the courts will consider um, like four different four key principles, um, which will guide them in like arriving at like a fair and just sentence. Um, so I know that it's like proportionate punishment, deterrence, prevention, and rehabilitation. So when I read it, I'm like, oh, okay, 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 okay. But then like when I look at it a little bit deeper, it's like, hmm, I have a little bit of questions uh, here and there. Uh. So let's go like one by one. Um, firstly, like proportionate punishment. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on like what it actually means? Okay. So um, proportionate punishment, for example, is, um, is when you want to punish an offender according to the blameworthiness and according to the seriousness of a crime. Um, so the more serious the offence, uh, the more se severe right, the sentence should yep. be, as opposed to like you slap someone versus you stab someone. Clearly, there will be a difference as to the sentence. Um, so in rape cases, for example, offenders should be sufficiently punished to address the serious harm caused to the victim. So that's what mm. it means to be proportionate punishment. Yep. So, sorry, I think my connection was a little bit there. Well, bad there. Yeah. Uh, but moving on, um, so the difference between like, okay, so the next two uh, principles are deterrence and then prevention, yeah. right? Which, I mean, from like a layman point of view, like those two are very, very similar. Um, so like, what is the difference between like deterrence and then prevention? Okay, so um, deterrence is really um, um, how the sentence that you issue should deter the offender and the general public from similar behavior so um okay this crime say like uh, armed robbery right um the law requires the court to impose a mandatory minimum sentence to ensure deterrence because there is a like this is really it has to be a certain way because you want to show people that hey it's not right so you you put it at a certain level so that people don't do it and the mm. offender also will not do it again so that's something that um uh, uh, you know, um, you put in and uh, repeat offenders are also given higher punishment to kind of deter them so they know that if they do it again, it's higher, you know. Uh, so that's what deterrence is like. Okay. Uh, 
On the other hand, prevention focuses more on the threat to public safety. So um, okay. the point is to actually issue uh, a sentence that protects people um, from um, being, you know, um, taking that person away from the community and um, because he or she is a threat to the community. So uh, while okay. deterrence, yeah, so while deterrence and prevention are actually different things, the application may overlap. So like, um, mm. you know, a, a serial rapist, for example, will be sentenced to a lengthy jail term um, to deter him from reoffending. And um, understand. But you are also put there in prison because he is a danger to society. So you want to put him away. So that's, right. that's what the, the sort of uh, difference between deterrence and prevention is. All right, thank you. Um, so, you know, just now when you gave me the example of uh, like a, a successful case of rehabilitation, right? So, I mean, one of the questions that did pop up uh, as you were explaining or as you were going through that, 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 that case is that like, you know, every person actually will take very differently uh, to also mm -hmm. to different forms of rehabilitation. Um, mm -hmm. So like in the how does the court um decide like the effectiveness uh, of like rehabilitation in the sentence mm. so um rehabilitation is uh the intent of it is really to reform right the the offender okay. so uh there are different things that the court considers so maybe i just want to kind of go back to um what i described earlier um, yeah. the treatment the different treatment between the uh, youth offender and the adult offender right so when you are dealing with a youth offender, because mm -hmm. of the age, because of the fact that they are, you know, research has shown, you know, as a younger person, you um, may not be as mature, right? And so these considerations um, make it such that rehabilitation is a dominant consideration when you talk okay. about youth offenders. So then that's like the main thing that the court looks at. But when you talk about adult offenders, um, it's a different consideration, right? Um, so... Um, the uh, first-time offenders, if it's a first-time offenders or if there is real propensity for reform, this is something that the court will really look at um, in deciding. Okay. Um, so, you know, speaking to the community, right, I think what a lot of like young people like myself and, you know, the people who are following, um, they, we are, what we are concerned about is like the protection of vulnerable victims we feel like perhaps that might not be enough. Um, so maybe you can share like some, some ways in which, you know, um, the law protects vulnerable, vulnerable victims in that, in that sense. Um, this is a very important point um, because vulnerable victims, because of their circumstances, um, are very, um, uh, can't protect themselves, right? So all the more um, when we do make laws, we really need to uh, make sure that there is extra protection for them. So um, the, the law actually generally takes a very tough stance um, against offences committed against vulnerable victims. Um, and so recently in 2019, the penal code was amended. Firstly, enhanced protection for victims, um, for example, of those who are intimate partners in a close relationship with the perpetrators or if the offender commits hurt offences against the victims, and um, they can be sentenced up to like twice the maximum penalty prescribed for the offence. So, um, for example, an offender who rapes a victim, who is the intimate partner, the maximum sentence of 20 years imprisonment can actually be doubled to 40 years. So that's wow, how okay. really, you know, enhance it. Um, there is also um, an increase for the uh, maximum punishment caused for, hurt, for causing hurt, from two to three years of imprisonment. Um, and sexual offences in particular is taken very seriously. Um, so we introduce specific offences to tackle technology facilitated uh, sexual offences. Um, there's okay. offence of voyeurism and there were also enhanced penalties for some offences to achieve a, a deterrent range. Now. Because remember, if it's higher, then it makes people not want to do it, right? So yeah. we also added that. Uh, these amendments came into effect on the 1st of January 2020 and um, so only apply to acts committed after that. Thanks, thanks for that. I think that's very, very helpful. Um, you know, I want to maybe look at a little bit more about the NUS, um, oh, sorry, like the university background of, of, of things and like, you know how there is this like concern that um, like people with higher educational qualifications will kind of like 
be given lighter sentences. Um, and like, you know, in a, so when I was discussing it, so many people were saying that like, oh, you know, uh, like uh, they, uh, they, they do think that a university background equals to like lighter sentences. And there was this recent poll amongst like 500 young people, um, over 80% of like the respondents felt that a university education equated to a get out of jail card. Um, so maybe you can address some of these sentiments because a lot of other young people like myself basically really just want a point blank answer. Is university education really pretty much in a sense um, a get out of jail card? And an extension to that question is like, are academic qualifications relevant in sentencing? Hmm. The point blank answer is that a university degree is not a get out of jail card. That's very clear. Okay. Um, and okay. Um, I can appreciate the sentiments that like I said earlier, you know, um, this is what people read and hear uh, of the cases that are made known to them, right? But actually the courts have clearly stated that the social status and um, academic qualifications of the offender per se are not relevant, are irrelevant because everyone is equal in the eyes of the law. Uh, so clearly, a university degree is not a get-out-of-jail card. And I've already mentioned earlier the case where I said the Chief Justice actually overturned the decision um, for uh, that particular individual who actually showed that, you know, um, because of his circumstances, because of his wife and kids, he um, had great rehabilitative um, tendencies. So the court actually gave him um, uh, a community based sentencing. So um, the courts will actually look at the whole picture to assess we have um, my internet just cut out. Sorry, I was paused for a bit just now. Yeah, okay. Uh, huh. So I was saying that uh, the courts will actually look at the. Can I continue? Are we good? Yes, yes, please do. Yes, yes, yes. So um, the courts will look at the rehabilitative potential of the offender. And um, uh, so. You know, if a person actually shows perseverance, um, some promise in their studies, um, this might be evidence of um, rehabilitative capacity, right? So if you are more likely to be, you know, in school, uh, more likely that you are going to be refraining from criminal conduct. And so these studies, right, can be anywhere. It can be a student in university, polytechnic, um, ITE, as long as you're showing that propensity of actually... Um, um, willing to do better and reform. And um, this is, you know, um, what is um, the, what the court actually considers. Lah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. Thank you for answering, answering that. Um, so in the case of like the NUS dentistry student, right, he was sentenced to like different, you know, CBS, uh, I mean, community-based sentences. So like, what, what exactly does the CBS entail? Maybe we can find out a little bit more about it because, mm. you know, you're, we are saying that like, hey, if we don't agree that a, 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 a sentence is uh, just, then we should voice out, right? So maybe let us understand first, then we make the decision whether or not, you know, we agree or not. So... CBS or community-based sentencing was something that was introduced in 2010 to give courts greater flexibility in sentencing um, um, younger people. Uh, but it is not applicable, firstly, like I said earlier, to serious offences, so like such as rape or cases involving repeat offenders, because the focus of CBS is on rehabilitation, and um, okay. but it also achieves some other objectives like uh, tendency objectives like deterrence lah. Um, and what are some of the orders that can be made um, in uh, uh, CBS it includes um, a short detention order a mandatory treatment order corrective work order community service okay. order day reporting order so I would just mm. like to highlight at this juncture that a short detention order is actually jail <laughs> is, oh, is okay. actually going to jail um, so it's not like there is no imprisonment term, it is actually going to jail. So it's just that um, there are just certain uh, shorter detentions that are put in. So, um, it, yeah, so in, in the CBS option, the offender can be imprisoned to up to two weeks. Um, but what is meaningful about CBS is that because there is that propensity of rehabilitation, uh, apart from these shorter orders, right, um, um, the 
um, punishments, uh, sorry, the um, charge, the uh, conviction can also be taken as spent. It means that that record will cease to exist. So the point is to try and actually um, help and rehabilitate some of these people. Okay, understood. Yeah. But I have a question then, because now I'm a bit confused. Like, how is CBS different from probation? Okay, so um, they're completely different things. Um, so I mm -hmm. go back to just now my um, explanation about the youth um, and the adult offenders, right? Okay. Um, the um, treatment is different. So probation. So for youth offenders, because rehabilitation is the key thing, um, uh, probation is one of the things that's typically looked at for youth offenders. It's either probation or RTC. Um, and so it really is more commonly ordered for those who are below 21. Um, it's, it's not really something that applies to um, adult offenders. Um, and so for when the court makes a, a probation order, it's typically um, a supervision by a probation officer for a period between six months and three years. And during probation, there will be certain conditions offender is required to follow, including curfews, um, attending rehabilitative programs and programs for a community service, but it's really for youth. Um, CVS, on the other hand, is more applicable for adults because it's one of the many things that the court can order. It can be imprisonment, can be um, fine, can be whatever, right, depending on the um, crime. CVS is one thing, but like I said earlier, you have to, only certain offences will qualify for CVS. So that's why it's actually okay. different. Mm. Okay. So speaking of CBS, right, like how I see CBS is kind of like a lighter sentence, right? I mean, we can all kind of basically agree on that. Um, so like my question then is like, what happens if uh, someone who is given CBS uh, doesn't really take it seriously, you know, at all, you know, breaches like conditions of it, right? Um, what happens then? And then second, second part of that question is like, who will be actually monitoring the conduct of that individual? So, um, maybe I would just want to um, say firstly that uh, it will be a generalization to say that CBS is necessarily a lighter sentence because like okay. I said, um, there is short detention orders, which actually means the person actually goes to jail. Um, so, there are imprisonment terms, which can be one week. Uh, a short detention order can be two weeks. So, it means you go to jail for two weeks versus going to jail for one week, right? Uh, that's, mm -hmm. I just want to kind of um, explain that. Um, you mm. were asking about um, if someone breaches it, doesn't take it seriously, right? Um, so uh, a breach may entail a few things. Uh, it could uh, result in a variation of the community order, um, an administration of a warning, imposition of fine, and also in fact a revocation of the community order and imposition and of the original prescribed punishment. So it means that if you don't do it right, you can actually result in the offender being sentenced for the original offence, which may include a jail term. So, you know, if you don't follow this, then you actually revert back to that. So, um, typically offenders who are sentenced to CBS would be supervised by um, a correctional rehabilitation specialist from the Singapore Prison Service, and in the case of uh, the day reporting orders. Lah. Um, and for if, let's say, there is a mandatory uh, treatment order, there will be an appointed psychiatrist um, and uh, if it's a community service order, there will be an appointed community service officer. Um, uh, so uh, for, for the short detention order, the person will actually be in jail uh, during a certain period. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so I mean, you know how I, I you know, you know how I, I feel about like the, the the sentencing with regard to the NUS dentistry case, right? So, um, you know, it. I guess what I want to ask is specifically like, how is the severity of an offense taken into consideration uh, when deciding whether to impose like a CBS versus like imprisonment? Yeah. Hmm. So, um. We, we spoke about one of the sentencing principles, which is proportionate punishment. So I can understand where you're coming from because it is yeah. about, um, it must be commensurate because something like cannot be, you know, you get something um, um, so, um, an offence which is not so strong, right? Um, but we must be clear that CBS actually is excluded for serious offences. That's number one, you know? So if the offence carries a maximum punishment of more than three years imprisonment, then cannot use CBS already. So there is a certain benchmark 
that is already drawn in place for purposes of CBS. So if it does then qualify for CBS, in assessing whether it's CBS or imprisonment that is more appropriate, the court will consider whether the offender has a high propensity for reform, the seriousness of the offence and other relevant factors. Um, and so things like um, social status and academic qualifications in themselves per se is irrelevant um, in determining. But the point is whether there's propensity for reform. So that's, um, that's right. um, how the severity of uh, an offence is taken into account. Right. I mean, just adding, adding on to that and, and, you know, I think a lot of what the youth sentiment was is that, like, the act of, like, violence against someone um, is, con it should be considered more of a serious, like, crime, la, or at least should have, like, more of a serious uh, uh, consequence. Um, so in that case, like, is that, is that what we should be trying to voice out about that, you know, we don't agree with yeah. it? Is, is that it? So like, that's something. Um that, um, so he was charged, I believe, under Section 323 of um, the Penal Code. And, um, and in that, actually, the, um, within that section already, there were already amendments made, you know, to kind of, um, uh, kind of refine it further um, and um, actually distinguish between what is the severity of the punishment. So... Um, if anything, this is something that I feel that uh, we could definitely raise and decide and discuss because, you know, how much is too much? Um, what is wrong and um, what is considered actually very bad? I think these are feedback mm. that we definitely should um, put in um, for um, the review that Minister has, Minister Shan had already said that we were going to be doing. So, yes. um, I think, yeah, so this is something that I feel um, we could take in, but as it stands, as um, the charge that was given, it was something that did qualify for CBS. So the court was, um, you know, um, right to consider CBS in that circumstances. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so you, you mentioned the, uh, the review, right? So I, I do have a bunch of questions about that. But before we dive into the review, um, like I want to talk about like this meme um, that was <laughs> circulating during uh, yeah, you know, the whole situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I have to bring it up because like I, I, I obviously I resonated with it. I, I burst out laughing when I saw it. Also kind of because it's, to me, it was grounded in truth. La. It's your um, thing. So, you like to do all this also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not, yeah. So, you know, um, so basically like for those who don't really uh, know what meme I'm referring to, I'm referring to the one where it compared like um, how someone who spit over the railings was fined like two thousand dollars, three months jail, um, and then uh, like compared to like the sentence given out to this en uh, dental student, right? Like it was funny to me lah. So um, like why why is it that um, you know something as I mean to me la, not as serious as uh, like violence uh, is given like to me a much lighter sentence than like you know that case yeah because um, okay like I'll, if, if let's say we don't consider the law right like logically if I see someone spitting over the railing and I see someone strangling a woman uh, I'll be like okay yeah like the, the woman who's being strangled needs to have I mean the, the person who's strangling the woman deserves a, a more serious punishment you know so like what is the consideration then um, in the sentencing yeah of, of those two cases mm -hmm. okay I think maybe it's important to kind of give a context of that other case that you were referring to um, about okay. the uh, 18 year old man he actually pleaded guilty to the offense of public nuisance um, for spitting over a railing at a mall during the Doscon Orange. Um, uh, uh, that was the, 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 um, what he pleaded guilty to. And the court actually ordered him to nine months probation with conditions such as performing 60 hours of community service and um, remaining indoors for a specified period daily during the probation, duration of the probation. So he was not jailed for three months. Um, and um, that's oh, something that is okay. different. He was not um, issued with that uh, $2,000 fine. So what he was charged, what, what was ordered was a nine-month probation. And you know that one is a different thing, right? Probation with conditions. Yep, yep. 
um, and uh, 60 hours community service and remaining indoors. So that was the outcome for that case. So we've got to see that that's different. Huh? So this meme then is actually comparing totally different things. Um, right. What is three months jail, $2,000 fine is the punishment that the court may impose. It is like a maximum thing. It's up to three months jail, up to $2,000 fine. But that's not what actually was imposed in that case. Right? right. So you're not comparing apple to apple. Lah. Um, that's, not, that's not what happened. So now that the case of the youth in the spitting incident has been uh, concluded, right? We cannot compare. So we are looking at um, that case where I said um, nine months probation. So he was in jail or anything. Uh, 60 hours of community, community service and remaining indoors versus the dentistry student case where there was a 12-day short detention order, which actually meant jail, 80 hours of community service, and a five-month day reporting order. So the youth who okay. is, you know, you see, you've got the compare apple to apple. And if you see, I mean, to be fair, it's different and it's also in a way commensurate because that was not the eventual um, punishment which the youth who spat, spat got, you see. So we can see clearly from the outcomes okay. that with the relative severity of the case, the the outcomes are different as well. So right. I think there are two little points. Um, first, actual sentence imposed in most cases uh, does not usually come close to the maximum limit of the sentencing range for that offence because the maximum sentence is really all, only imposed in exceptional circumstances when the, question, the conduct in question really falls in the range of really thorough one, the very bad worst case. So then you push to the maximum sentence. And secondly, the context is very important because um, in view of the current COVID situation, right, it's also very important to deter, right? You don't want people to be spitting and you don't want people to um, be uh, doing all these things. So, of course, you've got to set a very strict and severe punishment. So, you deter the people who actually do it and also the general public from committing this offence. Um, and that was during a time, I mean, it's still, it's still very serious for us. COVID is something right, that right. Anyone. So there was a need to actually um, impose stiff punishments to achieve this deterrent effect. So I think that's something that we have to understand. Okay. So, so for me, like, I mean, thanks for clarifying, but for me, it's like, yeah, sure. Like, um, the, the, the spitting incident does deserve, like, like, I mean, I guess, like, a harsher punishment than, than usual because um, of the COVID situation. But then, I guess I also do see, like, the, 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 the violent case, I guess, like, Oops, another I mean, case on its own. Oh. Sorry, Joel. Are we, are we good? I was, uh, it was hanging for a short while. Well, could you just repeat? Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah. yeah, like I mean, I guess for me, it's like yes, like I do, I, I do see the the need for like the speeding case to be, um, you know, uh, have like a heavier sentence also. But then to me, I also see like se separate from the meme, right? Like the violent case in itself. Like my my point of view still stands that like, uh, the the sentence is slight lah. So, but thank you for clarifying um those two. Um, let's move on now to the um <coughs> min law and MHA review itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh in July, um like min law, sorry, Minister for Law and Home Affairs, um like Mr. Shamugam actually announced that there will be a review of sentencing guidelines and principles. Um, like so. Of course, when you announce something like that, like all of us immediately have a lot of questions, right? And we are like, hey, you know, can, do you have more details? So, um, like, are you by any chance able to, uh, like, share more about the review? Or has, 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 are more details available now? Okay. Well, the review is ongoing. And um, um, uh, Minister Shamgun had already announced that it was going to cover um, penalties for violent and sexual offences and the extent to which factors, including educational background of offenders, should be relevant in sentencing. The exact issues that people have raised as concerns. Great. So okay. um, the, the relative prescribed punishments for the different types of offenses, uh, you know, for example, hurt offenses versus theft of spitting. <laughs> so these are things yeah. that will be looked at, you know, um, as we are doing the review. It's still ongoing. And we okay. will take into account the feedback received. So in fact, um, you're going to be involved in this, the Youth Dialogue with Minister Edwin Tong yep. on 9th yep. of September. Yeah, so okay, we can reveal that it's Mr. Tong, right? It's confirmed. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so okay. I didn't 
the price. But yeah, yeah he's going to be the one who's going to be reviewing this. Okay. Um, based, um, because now he's Minister of uh, Culture, Community and Youth, as well as, you know, having some background in, in law. And so, best place for this. So, um, this is where young people can give their reviews. And, you know, your views, okay. for example. Yeah. You speak. Uh, these are things that I think will go into reviewing and improving our criminal justice system. Nice. Wow. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, during also during like the discussion period I had, right? One like one of the more pertinent points that came out was also how you know um, organizations like Aware uh, have proposed for cases involving violence uh, to be handled by specialized authorities who are trained. To handle mm -hmm. such cases, you know, given the mm -hmm. impact of trauma on on the um, on the victims themselves, so I guess it's, it's it's a call for more sensitivity and more, you know, uh, people who are who understand the nuance of like cases like this. Um, and then I asked like the, my followers, like, hey, like, like, uh, how like do you guys agree or disagree with this? And ninety five percent of them like agreed lah. So that's something I wanted to point out, you know. So uh, specifically, like. Uh, do you are you able to maybe like talk a little bit more about how what are some of the concerns and issues um, that have arise uh, arise that like MHA or Min Law will be taking into consideration? Uh, have there been any that you can reveal? Um, okay, maybe to address the point about um, um, how OWE has raised um, how you know we should have um, offenses like this, right? Uh, where it involves violence and um, something that's very traumatic to the victims. We really should have specialised uh, people looking at it. Um, I, I agree. I think that's very important. Um, okay. It's um, something that I think we can look at and I'll, I'll really definitely pass this over to um, MHA and Mindo for their consideration as part Thank you. of this review. Um, Thank you. Uh, but that said, I think what, we, what I would like to highlight also is the fact that um, uh, we already do have some things that we are doing within the current mm -hmm. criminal justice system to ensure sensitivity to the victims during the investigation okay. and court proceedings. So, for example, for one, police officers um, receive training on how to, uh, on the needs of the uh, victim. And this covers a wide range of issues, including the causes um, of victim trauma, the needs and their vulnerabilities placed by victim and victim management. We also have a group of wonderful volunteers, um, part of the Victim car uh, Care Cadre um, program. Um, and these are uh, volunteers who come from different backgrounds. They have um, backgrounds in psychology, <clears throat> um, uh, social work or counselling, and they are the ones who actually uh, provide the emotional support to victims. Um, so they, they have training also on court processes and counselling techniques. So they are there to help and support victims. So we do have mm -hmm. an aspect of that. Um, and also as we put things in court, right, uh, the expert evidence from psychologists and psychiatrists can also be um, given as evidence in court to provide overview of the um, studies on the impact of trauma on victims and how to apply such findings to the case to ensure that the impact of, on the victims are taken into consideration. So these are some things that are already in place. But, you know, as we are going along um, to look at this, we, we are definitely um, concerned and um, we can always do this better, you know. We can always improve it. And if uh, yep. um, other special agencies want to play a part, I think we can definitely review as to how this can be put in. Okay, so uh, I mean, of course, then my, my question will be that um, uh, how else or how so can young people uh, like myself, like the people uh, around me uh, have our voices heard? Because obviously we do have a lot of opinions on, this, on these things, right? So mm -hmm. what are some of the avenues mm -hmm. that we can look at? Mm. So I think one, um, a shout out again to that dialogue um, uh, that's going to be posted. <laughs> yep. that, you know, that's one definitely clear platform. Um, you know, um, I sit on the rich panel as well and that's an avenue that continues to be open. We can continue to give your feedback there. Um, Minlaw also takes in feedback and um, inputs from people. Um, so that's something I think young people can do. Um, but I also appreciate platforms like yours, you know, where people actually um, aggregate the questions and, you know, and use this opportunity to seek clarification, ask the questions. 
So these are some of the things that um, I think we can continue to build and work on. I think um, we are all really trying to hear youth voices on this. Um, yeah. It's important though that, as you said earlier, right, find out about it first, right? Edify yourself about it, understand, yeah. and then you yeah. give me full feedback. Um, and so that's something that we will continue to work on and do. All right. So we are on to the last few minutes of our live stream. So oh I just God. want to go through my last... So fast. It, it, time just flew, yeah, yeah you know, I just flew by. Out. Yeah, so like um, my, I have a lot, uh, a couple of more questions regarding like public discourse last. So, um, you know, I refer to an article by the Straits Times that I was also chatting about uh, uh online, uh, which said that you know legal experts that the Straits Times spoke to said that the the public is often not privy to many of the factors being weighed uh, when a judge decides on a sentence. And like most of these experts, right, they agreed that the sentence was fair and proportionate. In my opinion, I feel like it's so convenient for these experts to brush aside like the opinion of the public. Um, but to me, especially of someone who's like young, who's on social media, who has opinions about these cases, right? Like these opinions, public opinion is like inevitable, um, especially in 2020 in the age of social media. So as much as you're like, oh, you know, like they, they don't know, but like it's, it's inevitable. There has been some discussion also about how like the media has approached like the reporting of that, um, of those cases and like highlighting educational backgrounds and whatnot. So like the same article stated that like there were, you know, details that were largely unreported initially. So like, um, it's, it, it, it then sets aside like this kind of like weird situation whereby, yeah, like the public should in fact be more informed before sharing their opinions. But then in my perspective, I want to stand up for, you know, the public, right? And say like, yeah, like more information should be made accessible to the public, uh, maybe in also like easy to, to digest ways. Uh, so like, to you, do you think that's like a feasible suggestion? Like why, or, and, 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 and if, if so, like why or why not? Can yeah, you tell I'm shaking? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like shaking saying this. <laughs> I think it's a, an important observation and it's a very, very important point because um, the reality is this, right? Um, media has to kind of sell, right? So um, how they choose the headlines, um, especially on, on social media, it's all clickbaits. You know, you want to try and make it very sensationalized and um, exciting. So they can choose what facts they place emphasis on, right? Um, but after, for example, that NUS Dentistry student case came out, um, there was there were a lot of uh, media traditional media outlets that tried to publish fact sheets about community based sentences and then the commentaries, as you mentioned, right? Um, and the intent was really to um, educate. So the resources and content is there, um, but the point you raise is how does that get? channeled to people, um, especially on the social media space, um, and in digestible form where people can actually appreciate and um, 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 understand. And I think that's work in progress. Um, you know, that's something that um, we can definitely all work to do better. Platform like yours, right, um, um, okay. really um, converts um, something that's maybe very heavy going and technical and very broad to something that is in bite size and you ask the questions. So this is useful. I think we're constantly looking at how to, to do this um, and you know, suggestions from young people and how this can be done would also be welcomed. You know? um, so we a, a appreciate the, the concerns. The, it's not like for a lack of not having answers or resources. You, know, you have the yeah. information, but how then do you channel it? And, and that's something that I think we need public and the community to also um, tell us so then we can transform and simplify some of this information and make it something that can uh, be as viral as the original sensational news perhaps so people right, can right. continue to um, be edifying it but I really uh, appreciate um, uh, your efforts you know um, um, in taking key things like GE like you know this issue and um, reaching out to people getting what is it that they are concerned about, putting it in a certain manner, and then getting an opportunity for me um, to clarify. So I think that, yeah. that's something that's meaningful. Yeah, thank you so much also. I, I think uh, having this session is, has been such an interesting experience for me because like, I do think that it's probably what, one of the first times where such a ground up uh, movement or initiative has really taken shape. So like, whew, super excited <laughs> that this has actually happened. You know, I, I didn't, I, I, today I was just like, is this going to happen or not? Because like, I was so like scared, you know, I was like, 
yeah, <laughs> but I'm I'm happy lah. I'm happy. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, it's interesting you feel that way. Um, I suppose speaking from um like sort of my side, right, of the house, we are constantly looking for opportunities to reach out and explain to people in the public. So as MPs, for example, when we have a chance to meet our residents, we do that. Um, but scaling right. it up half, right, because you only meet a few people physically. So mm. platforms like yours really allow for a greater outreach and okay. I think that's something we can continue to build on. Nice. Um, on that note, then, like, maybe I want to ask, you know, what are some ways uh, in which uh, young people can do to be more informed and have a clearer understanding of the full picture before we comment online on things? I think that's um, like a habit, like a, a, one thing you have, right, which is that you, you find out first about something. And that's something that we have to keep doing, that uh, there should be instinctive in us that before we post or comment to really... Um, understand first the full facts before we, we take a position. Um, and um, in as far as uh, legal cases are concerned, for example, when the media reports it, there is actually typically a grounds of decision by the court that's out there. Um, and that's available on Singapore Law Watch, for example. So um, you may want to kind of read that judgment first and know the full facts before you actually okay. make a comment, for example. That's one way. Um, the other Thank way you. is the state courts also um, publish um, guidebook for accused persons and also goes into detail about the different okay. court proceedings. So if you go to the state court website, you know, there's also a lot of information. So okay. um, that's something that um, is useful as resources. But I think it's also important for us to keep an open mind um, and not just take everything you read and see online as at face value. Especially if uh, there are people who are content creators, right? Um, you have a significant following. Because personally, I feel that social responsibility, right? You don't want to kind of just yep. talk emotions and tell people things um, that may kind of steer people a certain way without fully understanding facts. So, like, the duty is on you then, like, um, um, the greater responsibility to really get the facts right, present a fuller picture, um, but I do recognize that with even with our best efforts, um, sometimes information only comes later. Lah. And, um, mm -hmm. But then I think when it does, I think we also have to be open in re-evaluating and revising our views. So I think that's how we grow. Um, so for me, it's just um, a social norm that I think we have to start creating, you know, when you are offering opinion or criticism. Let's think objective. Let's think um, constructive. Don't just be emotive about okay. it. Because then you can't take back. Okay. Um, you know, there's this Malay saying uh, um, that um, okay. um, that if you uh, a boat floats away, you can still pull it, but if words are fast, you can't take it back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay. that, I think it's important that um, you know you think about it because the implications can be severe, um, especially okay. things like cancel culture. You know, um, I'm particularly yeah. concerned. It's okay. About it because when you make personal attacks, you don't really talk about the issue, then it, it impacts the individual and their families. Um, so right. that's something that we really should think about. So, um, okay, when it comes to issues that's close to our heart, I think really edify ourselves, find out the full facts, don't be emotive, be constructive, and always look at how we make things better because then it makes public debates more meaningful, more constructive. Understand. And I, I really personally feel that we should find a Singapore way of doing it because we've seen how uh, polarised views can impact a community. In other countries, you see people taking sides, you see the cancel culture. That is very, very unhealthy. And I feel that as Singaporeans, we all should try and step up and um, be uh, a bit more um, honourable about our behaviour right online so that we are actually doing meaningful things and building on the debate that we have and really championing issues, but really be very clear about um, um, how we can make, move things forward. So um, that's all I, I'll leave you with. And uh, Joel, I just want to say you're doing a great thing. And um, I hope this is something that uh, will continue to grow um, and that, you know, people continue to learn from, from the platform. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much once again for coming on. Yeah, I guess we've come to the end of today's episode. Thank you guys so much for coming on to this hey. um, live stream session. <laughs> and thank you for how you for you know doing thank this. So you. so grateful. Thank you. Yeah.